Welcome to Sunny Bitcoin. In this episode, I have as my guest Dave Perel, co-founder and CEO of Compute North, a Bitcoin mining company based in the US. I really enjoyed myself because this is the first time I've had a conversation with a Bitcoin mining expert. We discussed why Bitcoin mining is a critical part of the Bitcoin network. What are the recent trends in Bitcoin mining? Is this a good time to invest in Bitcoin mining and lots more? So let's dive straight into it. Um, hi, Dave. Uh, thank you for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. Sunny, thanks for having me today. Uh, so what's the deal with the Red Bull dispenser behind you? It seems like you're a VIP customer of uh, a Red Bull. Is that true? <laughs> it's VIP and then there's a step above VIP and we're whatever that level is at this point in time. So hopefully you've tanked up on it um, for this uh, podcast recording. Uh, but anyways, Dave, tell us a little bit about your background, how you started Compute North and um, how you entered into crypto mining. Yeah, thanks, Sonny. So yeah, I will say that uh, part of the uh, efforts here at Compute North has always been highly caffeinated and Red Bull and Monster help us achieve that in good ways. So, uh, But I'm Dave Perrell, CEO, co-founder of Compute North, uh, been in the data center sector and managed services space for about 25 years. Uh, founded Compute North in 2017 with another YPL or uh, PJ Lee. Uh, when we got very interested in what was going on in the, the Bitcoin in the Bitcoin mining space, right before what I'd consider the the first craziness and the run of uh, late 2017. Um, I uh, hail from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and for those of you who know Minneapolis, it's quite a cold destination, particularly in the winters. And I was looking for a way to heat my garage for my wife and my small children. And uh, I got interested in putting in some, some Bitcoin miners in the, in the garage to serve just that purpose. What I didn't realize is how loud they were, how much energy they used. But I learned, learned that in, in very short order. Um, and then I got compelled. I'm like, this is kind of an interesting business. I'd like to explore it in some more detail. Uh, what I found out really quickly is that unlike my previous data centers and my managed services uh, businesses where we would co-locate and build these data centers by fiber, we have to have access to a lot of people, we wanted to be in tier one metros, this business was really predicated on finding large scale, low cost energy. And frankly, that wasn't something that was available in Minnesota. And that wasn't something that I found myself to be an expert at in any way, shape or form. And so I went through the YPO network um, through some of the, the lunch and learns and those kind of things. I got connected with PJ. Uh, PJ's got 27 years investment banking, uh, project finance, but really around energy and tech. So one of his private equity firms now you know, does development, wind and solar, uh, you know, large scale renewables all over the globe. And him and I hit it off pretty quick. Uh, we both invest, invested seven figures into the business. And the original idea was to get mining, find a host and kind of, you know, parlay from there. Uh, and what we found out through that process is that there was a real lack of what I'd consider credible, low cost hosts that we felt could scale with our business. So we ended up doing it ourselves. Uh, we ended up in West Texas, uh, in, in the U.S. and in the world, one of the lowest cost energy regions. Um, you know, very uh, deregulated grid, very strong access to power. And we ended up at a former World War II Air Force facility that has since been abandoned, but still had the electrical infrastructure in place. And within about 60 days, we were up and we were operational. And what we learned through that, it was a real opportunity that uh, other, other customers and other businesses were looking for the same type of similar services. They wanted to get into mining. They didn't know who to trust. And we felt there was a real business there to really set ourselves apart. So since that time, you know, we now have uh, three sites under management, uh, very parts of the United States in uh, Texas, Nebraska, South Dakota. We have two other large scale sites under development. And we've really become one of the, the go to's in the industry for miners that are looking to scale, looking to do it at low cost and really looking to do it with an energy centric approach. And what I mean by that is the days when I think you would plug in, use as much energy as possible, and just try to get as cheap of, of economics as possible are, if, are, are certainly numbered. And we're seeing a lot more sophisticated ways to partner with the energy providers, partner with the grid, be a good citizen, and as a result, drive down your cost of energy and your cost of economics. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that in the podcast. That's amazing. I think that's one of the uh, you know most odd 
uh, stories that I've heard of uh, somebody entering into the crypto space because you wanted to keep your basement warm, but that's <laughs> uh, that's really interesting. And uh, just for the uh, part of the audience which does not know, Dave is referring to YPO, which is a, a, a really useful networking organization, uh, uh, really helpful. We both are members of it. Uh, Dave is a member in the US, I'm, I'm sure, and I'm a, a member of uh, YPO in uh, Singapore. So uh, he's referring to that organization. Um, Dave, um, for those of you, for those of us who kind of don't understand uh, mining, uh, explain what mining is and, and why is it a critical part of uh, the Bitcoin network? Yeah, great question. I think the, the best analogy to think of mining is if you think of like American Express, American Express has large data centers that process these transactions. If you go to a Shell gas station, put in your credit card, pull it out, that transaction goes back to the uh, American Express data center. It says, hey, Shell's got $50 in their bank account. It puts a, you know, a, a debit on your account, removes $50 from the actual credit account, and handles all those, those transactions recordings. If you think about it in that way, Bitcoin miners provide the same service to bit, the Bitcoin network. They're fundamentally what makes it work, fundamentally what makes it secure, and fundamentally what allows it to scale. I think the key differences behind what I talked about earlier or the American Express Network analogy and Bitcoin is that it's vastly decentralized and it can handle large points or there's no single point of failure like would a traditional data center be. Um, in the case when you can, which just happened two weeks ago, you could take off 20 or 30 or 40 percent of the machines in the computing network and everything continues to run normally. Um, in this design, nobody controls it. Nobody can make single, you know, single, uh, I guess, non-consensus based changes to the network. And it, it's pretty phenomenal and, and pretty amazing what is, you know, started as what I consider a real thought experiment and a bit of a software code experiment has continued to scale and obviously is getting to the size and uh, I guess uh, effect that it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, such a revolutionary part of the entire ecosystem. And I think it's one of the most difficult parts of the ecosystem to explain to a new Bitcoiner. But um, uh, you've been in mining since now, uh, I think you've mentioned 2017, it's been four years. What are some of the trends that you are seeing in mining? Yeah, we're seeing some some trends. Um, I'd say I'd really classify it in four things. One, I would say just the scale is completely different than it was four years ago. Four years ago, we had a lot of customers that would be, in essence, I'd say consider retail investors, people looking to kind of dip their toes in the water, you know, put, putting, you know, several thousand or ten thousand dollars together, buying a number of machines and looking for someone to help and scale them. Since that time, the access to public markets, debt funds, you know, hedge, private equity, even, you know, we have, I think, five publicly traded companies that we count as customers. And they have pretty sophisticated ability to tap capital and pretty ambitious growth and sizing plans. So along with that, it's just it's just reached a whole new scale. Um, and obviously being able to, you know, being able to deliver that operationally is one of the challenges that uh, we're, we're, we're always excited to face. Secondly, there's, there's certainly been a big uh, shift and push to North America. You know, previously, you know, China was the largest Bitcoin miner and uh, they, they still are today. Uh, but I think North America is very much playing, playing catch up. And again, just the access to the large scale markets within North America, obviously, you know, rule of law, lack of geopolitical risk, um, the ability to, again, deploy capital and just the engineering prowess. I think is really giving North America really a, a big push in, in the mining sector. Um, third, uh, as I talked about earlier, we're seeing the what I consider the parasitic loads go away. And what I mean by that is miners traditionally would plug in, they'd run 24 by 7, they didn't care what was happening in the rest of the network and the rest of the grid. And at the end of the day, there's sometimes going to be better uses of the energy and the resources than is Bitcoin mining. Um, and I'll use the example of Texas. Texas uh, in February had a real rare weather event. Uh, it was very, very cold <laughs> and for several weeks on end, and it created a very big strain on the energy network and on the grid. And in those kind of scenarios, absolutely Bitcoin mining should be shut off. And things like health and human services and hospitals 
should be the priority. Um, and we can say that, you know, we participated in that, uh, i.e. that we were shut down. We stayed offline for a number of days and we turned back online. And those are things that we worked, uh, you know, to help align our customers. It's a win-win scenario because they received the financial benefits of that. And it's a win to the community and the grid because I think everyone agreed that we should be taking care of people. We should be ultimately, you know, putting those resources to the appropriate use. And that was a perfect example when that was done. And then last but not least, I'd say that the, uh, the good guys are winning. You know, Bitcoin's been an interesting ride. I talked to you a little bit about my background, but my first company was a internet service provider in the 1990s. And I mean, if you told people you had an email address or, you know, you were talking about a website, people thought you were a hacker or you were doing some some things on the Internet that weren't always uh, of the, the, the highest moral standards. Right. And I think in, you know, Bitcoin, we're seeing that real shift from is this something that's used for black market activities? Is this something used for terrorist activities to much more people are concerned about ESG? People are concerned about anti-money laundering. People are concerned about OFAC requirements and really being a good citizen. And the good guys are winning out. So it's been really exciting to see that narrative change. I think it is important as you know members of the, the Bitcoin ecosystem that we continue to push that and we continue to showcase that we are good citizens and we want to make this something that's sustainable and long term. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things that I want to unpack absolutely, which you mentioned. And it's it's amazing that you you mentioned that the scale of mining has completely changed since 2017 in the last five years. And I've been in uh, this space since 2015. And the last price cycle, it seemed that the scale of mining had completely changed since the previous five years, you know, because in the beginning of the Bitcoin network, people used to mine using uh, laptops. And again, like you mentioned, just a computer in the basement, right? So uh, it, it's amazing what uh, a crazy journey it has been in such a short time. And every few years, you just cannot recognize the previous phase of uh, Bitcoin, the network and mining. Um, and I also completely agree of this transition that we are seeing, or I, I would say the increasing participation of non, uh, you know, China countries, US being one of the major participants, and I want to dive deeper into it. Um, who is a typical customer client of a complete moth? And I, I don't know if you're comfortable to share some names. Sure. Um, I mean, a, a lot of this is on open press releases. Uh, like I said, we have five publicly traded companies that we count as customers and as clients. And you can go to our website and, and see those in very short order. But clients that are, again, very, very large access to capital, looking to scale their operations. Some of them, you know, have a geopolitical kind of a portfolio theory. They want some in North America. They want some in China, et cetera. Some have a very unique focus where they want North America only. Um, some, I would say, are trying to use old gear, you know, make it much more economical on a long-term basis, kind of repurposing those. And some are just what scale, right? And how do we, we take our, our uh, you know, economies of scale and use those as best as possible. The lowest, the lowest cost of capital, uh, the, the ability to access the markets at the highest scale, and then and, and blow and grow that up. Beyond the publicly traded companies, uh, we are seeing private equity. We're seeing some, you know, really sophisticated large family offices and then hedge funds are kind of the, the key customers that we service today. So your clients are typically investors who want to invest in Bitcoin mining uh, and not necessarily Bitcoin miners who already exist and want to, I don't know, um, uh, you know, use somebody else to manage their mining services or is it a combination of both? Yeah, it's a combination of both. I would say the bulk of our clients today are customers that are already know that they want access and they want to have exposure into Bitcoin mining. Uh, I wouldn't say that we do a lot of education among someone that's looking for a general investment. They've heard about cryptocurrencies and they're saying, are, are, is Bitcoin mining right for us? You know, most of the time someone's coming to us, they want to really scale. They want to do it at low cost. They need a trusted, credible provider. And they already have their thesis put together. We're a great solution for that. Um, to your question, you know, have we worked with, we've worked with a lot of funds. We've actually spun off one of our own funds, you know, in a traditional GPLP structure where customers can't have access into that. But at Compute North, you know, we're used to dealing with a lot of folks that don't want to deal with the development. They don't want to deal with the energy contracting. They don't want to deal with, you know, a hash board goes bad and a fan goes bad. They want to you know, really have the economic benefit of mining. And I think the pretty unique downside protection in which it provides versus just simply buying the coin on the market. And we have services that, you know, really kind of run the gamut to have a full course, 
uh, end to end solution for clients that really want to be hands off, simply make the financial investment and have full trust that someone is watching, you know, to make sure that their mining operations are run at high efficiency and at low cost. So definitely I want to talk about, uh, you know, investing in mining versus buying uh, Bitcoin directly off uh, the market uh, a little later. So primarily if I want exposure to Bitcoin or to Bitcoin mining, if I'm an h and family office or an institution, then I am a potential customer of Compute Mod. Correct. Yep. Oh, okay. And, and in that case, can you describe some of the products and services that you offer? Is Are they packaged in a certain way or is it a longer discussion? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, primarily at the end of the day, we are a landlord. And what I mean by that is we provide what's called in the, in the sector co-location services. Our customers normally have access to machines and have purchased the actual computing equipment. We develop and serve the sites. We provide all the infrastructure, the networking, and then all the management. Um, your question about packages, we do. We have three different tiers. That really depends on how hands-off or hands-on they want us to be. And so we have a different levels that depending on how much of that, that workload and that day-to-day -day management, they want us to take off their hands for them. Uh, we also do have customers that come to us that are looking to you know, find access to the actual computers. That's one of the biggest challenges that we see in the sector today is the lack of chips. The ASIC, you know, the actual ASIC machines themselves have gone up considerably along with the Bitcoin run. And so giving them some advice and feedback of when to buy and how to buy. And you always want to make sure, obviously, you're not buying at the, the peak and just understanding some of the nomenclature behind that. We help our clients throughout that. I'm, I'm assuming that the majority of the audience for this episode would be somebody who would want a complete hands-off approach and does not have access to any of the computers or the mining chips and stuff. Can you describe for them, is, for example, right now a good time to consider investing in Bitcoin mining? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think it is if you're playing for the long game. And what I mean by that is I think in Bitcoin mining, you always got to be very concerned and very, and very focused is probably a better term on the efficiency and the low cost component. If you think, if you take a step back, Bitcoin mining is really, in essence, a perfectly competitive market. And in the in the up markets, frankly, your 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 costs don't matter as much because your gross margins are so high. And today is a perfect example of of that. Uh, but in down markets, it can be in the difference between marginally profitable and and marginally losing money, and whether you're even going to survive. And that's why we've always had a manacle approach and a manacle focus to stay that low cost provider, drive efficiencies and all that we do and make sure that we're at the low end of the, of the cost curve, particularly at scale. There's always customers that, hey, I might have free energy. I got, you know, I, I, I had a nephew that had free electricity in his dorm room, which was a great deal for a year. He, he mined Ethereum for some time in that, but it wasn't scalable. It wasn't something that he could grow to, to in, institutional type scale. Um, and I think that's really important. The other piece beyond the OPEX and the operational side, which we really focus on, is making sure you're not overpaying for the actual machines themselves. And at the ROI period, I think some people make the mistake of simply taking what is today's profitability and projecting out 12 to 18 months. I see that as a real fatal flaw. And what I mean by that is things will correct. You certainly have the, the, the price and that can move. As we all know, anyone that's on this podcast understands that the Bitcoin price can and will be volatile. I think long term, you know, I have the the also the view that it is going to increase in value, but there's going to be volatility along the way. I think the bigger challenge you need to be focused on when you're a miner is what's called the difficulty and the hash rate, which in essence is how many miners are competing for those same 900 coins that are produced per day. And as that, think about the uh, as a pie, that pie stays the exact same until the next happening. And the more computers and the more processing power you have on for that, the more competition you have for those same 900 coins. And you either need to increase yours to keep up with it on a pro rata basis, or you're going to get a smaller percentage over time, which will play out. And I just don't see enough people focused on that, particularly with some of the scale and size of mining operations that I see just within our business coming online and across the world. So what would be a minimum transaction size uh, that a potential investor would uh, have, need to have to work with Compute Moth? Yeah, we deal with customers with as low as 10 miners today. 
But I would Which say US dollar terms would be sorry? Which in US dollar terms would be? US dollar terms. Yeah, like what would be the initial investment? I have no idea what a minor Yeah, no, a minor cost. great question. Right now that would be right around a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So even as low as hundred thousand dollars, somebody could come in a contract with complete math and get exposure to Bitcoin mining. Correct. Yes. And if today, as a potential investor, I come to you, what would be your estimate for a ROI for hundred thousand dollars? We see, you know, ROI estimates. A big part, uh, you know, again goes back to what is your view on difficulty, and what does that look like? You know, we coach our customers to try to be under the eight month ROI range. Otherwise, we think when you start to look at it, you might be overpaying for the machines. One of the ways to get access to lower cost machines is to contract it. And what I mean by that is take future delivery versus trying to buy on the spot market today. Um, and I get there's always a time value of money in here, but I also think you need to you know, look at what does that machine cost me to accelerate that mining to today. And we normally look at what is the cost per terahash. That's the, the unit of measure that really shows up what your hash rate looks like. And if you take the, the amount of terahash per second that your miner produces divided by the price, that's your cost per terahash. To put it in perspective, back in November, we were talking in the $20 per terahash. I have seen as high as $115 per terahash over the course of the last 30 days. So, I mean, it's almost a 5x change in pricing on the actual gear itself, which needs to be certainly thought through in terms of your investment thesis into the market. And absolutely, uh, you know, on sunnybitcoin.com, I've always been uh, recommending my audience to buy Bitcoin on the spot market, you know, like like the way you, you just kind of mentioned, over investing in Bitcoin mining. And that's the reason I'm really excited to learn about this. And, and primarily my reasons are that the risk is lower because lesser number of variables uh, to deal with and, you know, higher liquidity and arguably similar return. I, I, but I, of course, I'm not sure about that. What's your take on this advice? And do you think today, for example, uh, somebody investing in Bitcoin mining would be able to get an alpha over buying Bitcoin in the spot market? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's higher alpha, higher beta, right? And it, depending on your portfolio, I think it is important not just to you know look at the, the coin outrights. I think the mining exposure is very unique and very interesting. I think I see a lot of comparisons that say, hey, if I would have gone into mining, I would have made X. But if I would have got if I would have just bought the machine, I would have made Y. And a lot of times the 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 latter has shown to be more profitable. A lot of that is due to the run up on the Bitcoin price. What I think where I think mining is really compelling and really interesting is that there's downside protection if you're a low cost producer. And I'll talk about that pie example that I, that I that I alluded to earlier. As machines come online and people come online, again, that hash rate goes up and your percentage of that pie is going to get smaller unless you're increasing your hash rate. However, the opposite is true. And we saw this play out very clearly in the, in the crypto winter that if you're a high cost provider, and all of a sudden your marginal cost of production or your revenues are less than your marginal cost of production, you really have one choice and that's to get out <laughs> and actually turn off your machines, sell the machines, liquidate the machines, unless you're willing to continue to mine at a loss, which some people might do for two, three months, but they're certainly not going to do on a long-term trajectory. And then what happens is the more efficient, more cost-effective miners receive additional rewards. And that plays it out, again, to the earlier point until you reach perfect equilibrium to when the, you know, the highest, highest cost marginal producers are the ones that are making basically zero profit. And I think that is a really important context to have where if you think through this, if Bitcoin prices go down, what is my exposure? What does this look like? And I would, again, argue that in that situation, mining is going to be much more fruitful due to that, due to that component. And again, that downside risk. That's interesting. I mean, if you look at Bitcoin mining in general and consider, uh, you know, the high cost uh, miners as well, then of course the entire industry uh, could seem more risky compared to investing in Bitcoin. But if you're able to navigate Bitcoin mining and select the right miners, then I, I get your logic. Then in that case, you get exposure to Bitcoin on the upside, but you could potentially limit your downside. That's, that's really interesting. Do you think that American miners have a disadvantage to Chinese 
miners because access to mining chips is a very important variable. Uh, and I'm just assuming that American miners would be at a disadvantage in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that the ASIC game is going to continue to play out. I mean, long term, I see Bitcoin mining as really being a critical service. And I think it's going to be embedded in a lot of things that we see today. Um, we see a future where like the distributed one, one of the big things that's happening in the U.S. is energy sources are becoming renewable. They're becoming much more distributed, a lot more inter intermittency on the grid. And getting, you know, 99 percent uptime and, and that type of component is going to be a bigger and bigger challenge, we think, for what we consider non-emission critical load. We think that distributed compute will follow distributed generation and there will be different types of uptime based on the chip type and the, and the unit. And what I mean by that is where there's an actual farm system where you could think about where used types of machines for like today might be like the S9, um, one of the flagship products of 2017. It, 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 it still is profitable today. But if you're able to run it at a wind farm that's running at negative energy rates throughout the evening when there's no load, it's immensely profitable. And those are the types of situations that we think make sense. As far as access to chips, I think this is something that is a, is is not just a Bitcoin problem, but is a worldwide problem in regards to TSMC, Samsung, you know, kind of the congestion at the fabs. Uh, and one thing I've learned about, you know, high commodity prices, the, the solution for high commodity prices, is high commodity prices and that this will get solved. Um, we're seeing some of the big boys really start to apply resources to this. And I think over the, I mean, the, the problem is not a quick solution, but there's certainly wheels in motion in order to, you know, solve the supply chain on the chip side. And I think that's going to bring, you know, North America, you know, really at parity. What I would say is that our cost of energy is cheaper in North America. The scale is much larger. And I would just say, again, that geopolitical risk is minimized. You know, there's rule law, there's 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 clarity in the way that some of these rules and regulations are applied. Now, in the U.S., each state is different. You need to be able to navigate that. And that's something we have considerable expertise in. But it, like in the case with China, there's just a lot of fear and uncertainty because nobody knows what they're going to do with the, you know, the Chinese yuan coming out, the digital yuan. Some of the, uh, you know, there's been mining has been banned and then it's not and then it's good and it comes back. Just that lack of clarity. I think really can freak out markets. And that's why, again, I think we're seeing just a lot of uh, migration from, from China to the U.S. Yeah, I definitely agree that China has not made its stance clear on Bitcoin since years, in spite of the fact that there is a huge amount of activity that happens um, over there. And just to kind of play along with the shortage of chips scenario, um, there was an interesting uh, conversation that I had with another YPR, and I think he's going to be on a uh, on the podcast soon was that the fact that there's a shortage of chips means that hash rate cannot increase a proportionate uh, to the price like it has in the past, which means that Bitcoin mining could be potentially more profitable uh, in the next couple of years. Do you agree with this view? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, one that I'm remiss to, to fully answer because like a lot of things in Bitcoin, some of this is really opaque. And what I mean by that is what we see in terms of stated shipments and what some of the manufacturers are stating don't seem to line up with what we actually see in reality, meaning we are seeing a lot, a lot of deliveries, not just real, but we also see a lot of schedules, especially through 2022. We're even seeing customers now starting to place orders into 2023. And it's what we need to determine is what part of that is actually going to happen, what part is going to get delayed. But if you think about it in terms of percentages, like if Bitcoin, you know, increases by three, four hundred, five thousand percent, the profitability is going to go that up for miners until which time that that catches up. And the ability to scale, build out that much energy resources, that many machines, just being able to crank that out. There's a couple key supply chain constraints that do hold that down. And, you know, we see that, you know, um, that that ability to scale is isn't isn't easy. And it really takes a pretty sophisticated team around energy, technology, finance, operations to be able to pull all that together, especially at the types of, of scale that we're talking about. 
And I, I do foresee that, you know, mining is going to be a very, very profitable endeavor for the foreseeable future, assuming the Bitcoin price holds. And you mentioned about cheap electricity in the U.S. Um, again, just without any data points, I actually thought that there is access to cheap electricity in China due to, you know, the, all of this unused uh, hydroelectric uh, power over there. Is, is that, it, 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 what is your view? Is the view that U.S. electricity is cheaper than China? It can be. It absolutely can be. Um, and I, I would say that with, there's different ways to get cheap electricity. I talked a little bit earlier about parasitic loads, and that's what we see going on in China. The miners hook up, they take as much energy as possible for as long as possible. And to your point, they, they migrate. So we actually see a shift from coal, right behind coal, which is recently kind of the endeavor, and then during the rainy season over to hydro. And they actually take all these machines, which is an amazing migration, by the way. So someone that's very versed in the logistics of this, there, there's a lot of logistical challenges that I applaud the Chinese miners for what they do. Um, with that being said, what we see is a lot of different ways to monetize the energy markets without simply having to be a parasitic load. And what I mean by that is helping to balance the grid, being being curtailable is a really key element of this. And being able to do you know interesting and creative solutions like running behind the meter, and not necessarily taking out what I consider, you know, kind of the tragedy of the commons, like the general grid itself, not being a tax on that. And by being very smart about things like ancillary services and such, you can drive your, your costs much lower than they have in China um, and, and some of the lowest in the world, which is the markets that, that we really focus on and plan today. And you've seen over the last year a lot of institutional interest in Bitcoin itself, you know, with Tesla buying Bitcoin on the balance sheet, and we've seen increasing examples of that. You said a couple of public listed companies are your clients. Is that happening in Bitcoin mining too? And uh, are there any issues around compliance regarding that? Yeah, so, I mean, are they holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet? No, are institutions interested in investing in Bitcoin mining as an investment as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I, you know, our, our, our companies that are publicly traded have just seen their market caps explode over the course of the, of the last six months. Um, you know, they're, again, they all have different ways of approaching kind of what's their differentiator within the mining sector. Like I said, we have some unique ones that are trying to leverage access to used machines. Some are just trying to drive scale. Some are taking in some of the, the OFAC, AML, kind of, you know, again, the good guy hat, putting some of that kind of a, a customization into what they do. We see a lot of efforts in what's going on in the, in the pool sector. And it's seen a lot of innovation of how that works, particularly in North America. And everyone's got, you know, a really unique strategy and approach to the way that they're they're, bring, they're coming to market. Um, those are some of the, the, the vehicles that I think are the, the most uh, visible today that are just showing some of the size and scale of the changing mining landscape. And, you know, for some of these companies, there is this narrative by the media that Bitcoin consumes too much energy. And, and so in that way, it's bad for the world. What's your take on it? Yeah, I think, I think it's misguided in regards to focusing on the use versus focusing on the source. So again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but my co-founder is 27 years in, in the energy sector um, around development of renewables. And the big thing that starts to, to push this is obviously what's going on with the Biden administration. We're seeing a hard push to really move away from you know, base load in some of the traditional fossil fuels. But I think what's getting missed in that discussion point is what challenges is that going to create to the grid? Um, if you think about distributed generation, I mean, renewables are much more distributed, so a lot more distributed generation, and they're intermittent, right? Um, with, you know, hydro is probably the one that runs the most like a baseload asset, but even in the case of like China, like it's going to be most active during the rainy season. So by definition, it's seasonal for half the year. Um, wind and solar are, you know, uh, they're, 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 they're different every day, right? Some days it's sunny, it's night every day, the wind comes, the wind goes. Now, if you take enough of that, and you take enough portfolio theory within that, it works. But what really helps to do that is being also able to balance your demand and being able to shift that up and shift that down. And at Compute North, one of the things that we're really focused on is what we call tier zero computing. 
And we see that as a world of distributed compute that's very computationally intensive, but non-mission critical, meaning you can shut it down, you can shift it to another workload, you can shift it to another location, and you can do that in nearly real time. And if you think about that, it's really about taking those computing resources and bringing it to that source of the generation, which again, is gonna be even more distributed than it is today anywhere in the world. And so we see that type of world is going to, or that type of load is going to be essential to managing the grid of the future and even somewhat the grid of today. As you know, we see a lot of coal and a lot of these resources coming offline in the U.S. to make sure that, again, it is used for health, human services, heating, air conditioning, things to keep, you know, you know, people safe and people working um, before things like, you know, non-critical compute. And I think, again, being a good citizen of the grid is going to be a really important element for Bitcoin mining and, again, overall tier zero computing in the future. And do you think that, you know, with the financialization of Bitcoin uh, considered as a serious asset, is it possible for the first time for miners to raise money as equity or by issuing bonds and go long on Bitcoin, whereas in the past that they would be forced to sell Bitcoin to cover their operation costs? And has that changed your financial structure in terms of mining? Yeah, absolutely it has. I mean, just the, the large-scale Wall Street banks that have come into the space over the course of the last, you know, even six months has been nothing short of incredible. And that helps out the, the whole industry as a whole. Um, as I alluded to earlier, you know, we're, we're also seeing the good guys win. <laughs> what I mean by the people that are credible, the people that are being good citizens, really have, you know, ESG, environmental. They want to be a good citizen and they want to play long term. Um, that's helping on the capital front as well. You know, our business, you know, four or five years ago, trying to capitalize it was very daunting. I mean, people would look at you like, Bitcoin, what is that? Is that going away tomorrow? Is that something that's that's going to be something that's, you know, fly by night? Are you one of those people? You know, and PJ, again, my co-founder, myself, just been very focused on that trusted, credible element, building out a management teams that got background in all the key sectors necessary to you know, make this work, you know, energy, technology, data center, operations, finance bringing that together, moving at the speed of crypto, which you can imagine this sector moves really fast. You need to be very, you know, uh, you got to be in line with your customers' needs and time is money like 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 no other space. And then it's being, you know, really energy focused and, you know, that really gets you your cost efficiencies and taking that development mindset into this sector has been just absolutely critical. And one example of what you are saying is, you know, you've been in recently in the news for your, agreement with Bit Digital, which is a NASDAQ listed company to provide, again, like you mentioned, renewable energy focused Bitcoin mining for them. Tell us a little bit about Bit Digital and, you know, this agreement to kind of give a, give a flavor of the kind of, uh, you know, contracts that you come into. Yeah, Bit Digital has been a, just a great partner of, of Compute North, one of several, you know, publicly traded NASDAQ companies that we work with today. And it's been fun to be a part of their story as they continue to scale. Um, like a lot of our customers, you know, they've gone into a, they, they've gone public, you know, recently through a, you know, a shell vehicle, and they've been really working to bring transparency and visibility into this sector. Um, they got some unique approaches where they're really focused on the cost element of acquisition of equipment, um, of, you know, even doing things like buying used machines and being a good citizen to the grid. That's two of the essentials that they've taken. Um, a lot of their operations traditionally have been in China. So they'd be, again, a great use case of a customer that's seeing a lot of advantages to expanding in the, the North American market. So it's been a fun, fun to see them continue to evolve, continue to scale, be successful in the space. And uh, you know, we're, 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 we're cheering them on and we're, we're excited to be a part of the story. And Dave, do you have any views about the centralization of mining pools, which has not really come up uh, in the recent past, but comes up once in a while. Yeah, I think, you know, decentralization, I think, is critical to Bitcoin. I think it's core to the whole, you know, even DeFi movement is that no single person entity can control or make changes to Bitcoin, the consensus algorithm or what it does. You know, when I compare it with some of the other networks like like Ethereum, I just I see a group and they can simply they they, they, they kind of play 
president and overlord, right, at the same time. And while I think it's, I, I love what Ethereum's doing, and overall, I just love the innovation in the sector, innovation of the space. The thing that I think is great about Bitcoin is no one owns it. it it's scaling, it's growing, and, and I see it really as kind of the layer eight, right? Like another standardization to the to the internet, which I think a lot of other things be built on. And it, it's the largest publicly, or, or you know, public blockchain, and it's only one that's got, you know, 12 years of credibility. Like nobody else can state that and nobody owns it. So the point of the pool is I think that's a pretty critical element of how much power the pools truly have. Like when you take a step back, the decentralization of the mining, while that is important, what really matters is what pool they're choosing because they're the ones that ultimately are going to control the nodes, they're going to control any types of decisions of how you know different consensus algorithms are implemented and not. And I do think that's something that we got to continue to watch. So I think competition of credible groups on the pool side is going to continue to be important. The good news is we're seeing innovation in North America. You know, we have several partners that we work with today that are doing things around EML, OFAC, you know, know your customer laws. Again, good citizens. We're seeing some pools now that are focused on green mining, like the carbon free element, which is also very intriguing. And again, just to, you know, trying to be good citizens. But it's my hope and it's my expectation that there's going to continue to be a lot of competition around that. So that does stay decentralized to the, the whole tenant of Bitcoin. Yeah, again, uh, because I do not spend too much time focused on Bitcoin mining, but I do know that there is some kind of work being done, some kind of innovation in terms of you know making mining pools less centralized like the way they are. Um, does Compute not do only Bitcoin mining or do you do uh, mining for other cryptocurrencies as well? Yeah, so I mean, we focus again what we call the category of tier zero compute. So think of it as non-mission critical, highly computationally intensive workloads, and that works great for any type of mining that is proof of work. So Bitcoin is the largest and best known, but Ethereum, Monero, Zcash, and you know, Saya. There's a whole slew of different networks that we focus on and that we work on today on behalf of our customers. We think there's some really interesting other you know, types of protocols and networks. Filecoin is one that we're watching very closely as that continues to expand, which is you know, based on hard drive mining and space allocation, which we think has got some really uh, uh, interesting uptake and, and upside. Uh, but you know, we, can, we can do anything within that sector, within that space. And uh, you know, obviously, we've been, continued to grow and had a lot of success over, over the last few years. And within the crypto mining uh, services that you provide, how much of it is there for Bitcoin mining and how much of it is there uh, used by other cryptocurrencies? Yeah, great question. I believe 90% plus of our our portfolio that we manage on behalf of our customers is Bitcoin mining today. Um, we do have our own you know, software, a proprietary stack of a application we call Miner Sentry. This gives us real-time insight into every single miner at every single location where we can monitor hash rate, temperature. We can see, you know, making sure it's on the right pool. So that gives us full-time control. And so we can see this in real time of what's going on, help our customers out if they want to switch. Like in the case of Bitcoin, sometimes people want to move to Bitcoin Cash or another, you know, derivative of Bitcoin. And we can assist them within that. But the, the, the bulk and the large scale growth right now is certainly around Bitcoin. What do you feel about Ethereum's planned update from proof of work to proof of stake, which I believe will make the role of miners irrelevant, at least for the Ethereum network? Yeah, so we've been watching that pretty closely around what's going on with Ethereum. Uh, one thing I know about standards is once they're in place, they're very hard to change. <laughs> and I'll use the example of, you know, I still had customers, you know, just a few years ago that still did their payrolls on IBM AS400s that were discontinued in the, I think, the early 90s. Um, so along with that, what, what I get excited about, I think it's great that Ethereum is trying new things. And they're trying different elements. The concern I have with proof of stake is less around the technical components of it and more around the economics of it. And what does it really do to wealth concentration and as a result, control around the network? And I think that has yet to play out, but I think there's significant risk within that. Now, also to that point, I've been hearing about the proof of stake conversion and move since 2017 of Ethereum. And I remember being said it was imminent back then as well. 
one thing I've always learned about software, especially at scale, especially with good developers at time, it takes three X for them to get through, you know, the time frame that they initially allocate about five times as much. And that continues to be true. So I think it's a great thought experiment. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. But I, I, I am concerned that proof of stake's got some inherent vulnerabilities in the way the economics play out. But to that point, the last paper that I saw, I think there's now 27 different types of consensus algorithms and ideas. And it's great. I mean, it's just, it, it's fun to see the different ideas and different approaches people have and these experiments at scale. And sometimes you really don't know what works and what doesn't until you try it and get it out there. And I applaud a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people that got some really innovative thinking of, of new ways to do it. No, I completely agree. I think a lot of people when superficially read about proof of stake versus proof of work, they don't get it. And they just look at kind of the advantages which are written down for proof of stake. But as you mentioned, there are some fundamental concerns about the economics around proof of stake, which hasn't really played out. And that's, I believe, there are those fundamental risks to Ethereum in the future. And again, even just with the release time. So I, I completely agree with that. And I think in that kind of risk re uh, return profile, um, I'm always uncomfortable to recommend Ethereum, at least on Sunny Bitcoin. And well, that's the reason the family name, Sunny Bitcoin, you know, not Sunny, Sunny Ethereum or Sunny Crypto. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you might be sort of Sunny Crypto before it's all said and done, right? So, yeah, this was a very conscious decision, you know. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Any future plans in terms of uh, Compute North or any uh, Sunny Bitcoin special announcements? So we're excited. It's been a big year for us. Um, you know, one of the things that I love about this industry and the space is there's just some great partners. I mean, even people that we directly compete with, that we just <laughs> had a chance to network to so, some really great people. And a lot of folks in this space just help one another out. Again, when I go to the, you know, the good guy hats, the people that are really good long-term players want to see the community and want to see this entire sector thrive. Um, so, it, it, we, you know, the reason we've been successful has been just a result of, of those partnerships and, and, and just our team um, and, and just great customers. So within that, we do have, you know, large scale growth plans this year um, along with our clients. And we're just going to keep doing what we do really well, which is doing the development, doing the operations, taking really the, you know, the, uh, the engineering and the operational side on behalf of our clients and helping them scale, helping them grow and helping them be very successful. So stay tuned for more news along that uh, throughout the coming months. Devin, before we wrap up, if you know somebody's interested in investing in Bitcoin mining through Compute North, how can they find you, follow you or follow Compute North? Yeah, the best resources would visit our website at computenorth.com. Um, there's contact information for all of our social media, for Telegram, um, and for, you know, traditional email, web forms, that kind of thing. Uh, we do got a, you know, a great team that can help, you know, answer key questions, walk through some of the economic models, and again, go as far as to helping source gear and equipment, if that's the direction that you're looking to go. And we, we do host tours. We're always happy to bring people on board, shore actual facilities, you know, corporate offices, all those kind of things. Um, because, again, we do think, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a few really good partners in this group that we think are trusted, credible and, and scaling. And we're, we're fortunate to be among that circle. Dude, it's always a pleasure to do an episode with a fellow Vipure who's in crypto. The number is increasing, uh, you know, with every passing year. And Bitcoin mining is a critical part of the industry. Uh, we all know that, but I have never truly focused on it from an investment point of view. So this was really a fascinating conversation. I, and I learned so much. Uh, if you like this video or podcast, please share and subscribe, Dave. Thank you for doing this and thank you for coming on Sunny Bitcoin. Thank you, Sunny. Appreciate it.